Hello and welcome everyone um, to this Kubernetes AI day, which is running as part of the KubeCon um, uh, virtual event this year. And hopefully, you know, uh, we can all meet in person next year. It's always exciting to be part of KubeCon and giving, uh, you know, talks, but also, you know, listening to a lot of uh, exciting talks which are happening. Uh, so what are we here for? So myself, uh, I'm Animesh Singh. I'm the Chief Architect for Data and AI Open Source Platform. And with me, I have Andrew. Andrew, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. I work mainly on Kubeflow, uh, integrating some of the trusted AI projects into Kubeflow, and then some auxiliary Kubeflow, KFP Tecton stuff as well. Great. So, so we are part of this team, right? And today here we are uh, to talk about, you know, how to stand up for ethical AI. And what we mean is essentially, you know, uh, with the proliferation of AI systems and more and more models being deployed in production, right? We want to make sure as we are building AI, right? We are bringing and building it in a trusted manner. And what it means is that, you know, we have techniques for bias detection and mitigation or being able to explain your model predictions or, you know, uh, being able to detect adversarial attacks being generated on your models, right? So that's the focus of this talk. And then, you know, we are going to talk in the context of Kubeflow, right? As, as we are aware, it's a very popular open source project. Uh, so both Andrew and I work for a group in IBM called Code, Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. What you see is a very nice picture of our San Jose Silicon Valley lab. We have a cricket pitch as well, if you are into that, right? We can have tournaments. Uh, but it's an amazing place, right? Uh, it's surrounded by green hills, and a large part of our team is centered there. But definitely, you know, the team is very globally distributed across US as well as other parts of the globe. And we contribute to open source projects, you know, across the end to end AI lifecycle, right? So, for example, you know, we are the second largest contributor to Qflow. Uh, we contribute heavily to TensorFlow and PyTorch. Uh, Spark, we have our own open source projects like Elira, Data Asset Exchange, Model Asset Exchange. So essentially work on strategic open source projects which are, you know, uh, being consumed by our products as well as take, you know, the innovations we are uh, doing inside and move it in open source, like some of the trusted AI projects which we are going to talk about today. Okay, um, and you might be wondering, you know, why this topic and why now, right? So I think we are all living in this, you know, unprecedented time in history, right? We are all in the midst of this global health crisis and hopefully, you know, we are now all seeing light at the end of the tunnel, but still quite a long way to go, right? And as part of this, uh, within IBM, right, we have had our, our own brainstorming and, and discussions around, you know, how we can help, uh, you know, make uh, the situation a bit better, right? We have been also focusing heavily in terms of bringing trust and transparency into AI, right? But does it really matter? Uh, I think it matters a lot more uh, in the times we are in, right? Even, you know, a Google search, simple Google search can show you that, you know, even at the time of this, this pandemic and crisis, what we have seen is, you know, uh, the, trusted AI techniques are all the more relevant, right? Uh, because when you are actually, for example, at this point, right, we are doing vaccine distributions. How do you make sure there is no bias in that distribution system, right? Uh, things like, you know, uh, being able to get tested, right? Uh, how do you make sure that, you know, the people who are being approved and being approached, they are not being done and approved in, in a manner where we are discriminating based on sex or race or you know, uh, based on the nationality of someone. So how do we handle it, right? So within IBM, right, we have our own uh, vision for trusted AI, but you know, we are also making sure that this is something which we are aligning with the industry. We are taking feedback, uh, always expanding it. Uh, but we, when we began, and, and at this point, right, our focus has been around four pillars of trusted AI, right? What we call robustness, fairness, explainability, and lineage, right? So what do we mean by it? Uh, these different things. Robustness means that can anybody tamper with your AI systems or AI models? Fairness means that is it fair? Is it not biased uh, towards a particular uh, race or gender or a nationality? Can you explain your model predictions, right? What it is doing, if it is making these decisions which are impacting my life, can it explain its uh, decisions? Last but not the least, right? Lineage, can I trace back and and make sure that you know if a model is giving life-changing decisions uh, for the stakeholders, 
we can trace back all the way, like on what data set it was it trained on, what were the hyperparameters used, uh, and and you know what version of a particular framework was used, so that you know you can create accountability where it is needed, right? So having right lineage is very very important. Uh, just to give you an example, right, since 2008, right, nearly every RST in a Broward County in Florida, right, uh, was being um, assigned uh, a criminal sentence, which was based on, you know, if they are likely to reoffend, it was based on uh, North Point's Compass algorithm, right, and, and based on research, and you can trace the link here, right, which was found, that data set was found to be heavily biased towards non-Caucasians, right? The other thing is explainability, right? Now, explainability is not only important for someone who is consuming the models. Obviously, it's the most important for that particular person, right? So if I'm being denied admission to a university or if I'm being uh, given a loan or, you know, uh, I'm being accepted into a company or denied into uh, acceptance into a company, the model should be able to explain to me, right? Very, very critical because these are life-changing decisions for me, right? I cannot buy a house, I cannot get into a company, cannot get into university. Thou shall explain why you did that. But more importantly, I'm not the only stakeholder, right? There are people in the middle, right? So there are government regulators, people who run compliance and safety. They need to be convinced that over a period of time what the model is doing, uh, it's able to explain itself why it is doing and why it is leaning towards those certain uh, predictions, right? And last but not the least, right, when we talk about adversarial AI, what do we mean? Right, a very simple example could be like, you are depositing a check of $151, let's say, right? Uh, but a hacker could, you know, adversarially modify your image. Um, and instead of, you know, uh, 151, like uh, it, to the machine, it appears as 757, because it's very easy to fool a machine learning system, right, and it will generate an image which can make a one look like a seven for a machine to understand. Now that's undetectable to the human eye. So the person, you know, uh, instead of who gave you the check, instead of having $151 debited from his account, he has now, you know, $757 gone, right? Um, that's, you know, more in the financial industry. But if you look at like, you know, the impact of this can be life-changing and more uh, scary in examples like this, for example, you know, a lot of the self-driving vehicles and uh, are being trained over stop signs images, right? Now, either if these stop sign images are adversarially modified more explicitly or implicitly, you know, over a period of time because of the wear and tear, right? These images are, are not great uh, or, you know, they have lost their uh, actual accuracy. Then, you know, the way the AI model will learn to detect them uh, will be less accurate, right? So that might mean that your vehicle, the self-driving vehicle actually running over a stop sign, right? And you can definitely imagine the consequences of a behavior like this. So uh, we talked about the four pillars of AI and, you know, gave you some quick examples why we think, you know, they are really, really critical in real uh, world. And to handle that, right, IBM actually created four projects and then moved it in open source, right? So projects around uh, adversarial uh, robustness, so both, you know, being able to detect if the models are robust and being able to mitigate them against adversarial attacks. That project is called Adversarial Robustness 360. Uh, for fairness, we have launched a project called AI Fairness 360. Again, you know, this is around bias detection and not only detection, but, you know, being able to mitigate bias in your AI models as well. AI Explainability 360 is essentially, you know, being able to explain uh, AI predictions, right, across for different stakeholders, right? And last but not the least, right, uh, project which we have not yet moved the code, right, but a lot of the, the research papers and the material have already been made public is around AI fact sheets, which is around, you know, creating this lineage and governance model so that you can trace back the origin of a model, right, right from the data set on which it started. So adversarial uh, robustness 360, as I mentioned, right, it's a project to actually uh, allows you to rapidly craft and uh, launch attacks on your models. If they are found, you know, vulnerable, you can have uh, defense mechanisms and defense algorithms which you can implement. Uh, there are quite a bit of uh, different kinds of, you know, evasion attacks uh, and defense and detection methods. You can assign metric score, robustness metrics to different kinds of models. Uh, so definitely try it out. It's one of the most popular projects which we have out there, right? We are also working jointly with DARPA 
uh, in terms of advancing the you know, tools and the techniques and the algorithms which are available here. AI Fairness 360, um, uh, a library to actually detect bias uh, across different metrics. So at this point, we support around 70 plus fairness metrics across the AI lifecycle, right? So what we call uh, pre-processing, in-processing and post-processing phase. So that means, you know, even before you start creating your model, you should be able to point this tool at your data set and be able to detect if there is bias in your data set. Once you have, you know, trained your model, you should be able to then uh, validate that model, right? Which is in processing phase. And last but not the least, right? Once you have deployed your model, right? You should be able to then, you know, monitor the model predictions and say, and figure out, right? If they are biased or not, right? So you can work across this life cycle, right? And not only this, right? So based on these 70 plus fairness metrics, if you are able to detect bias, there are 10 plus bias mitigation algorithms, which are provided as part of this, which essentially you can take and then, you know, mitigate bias across the AI life cycle. And last but not the least, right? AI explainability 360, as I mentioned, right? Uh, there is no one explanation which fits everyone. There is the end consumer who is directly impacted by the model predictions, but then there are, you know, uh, regulators and, and people who make sure, you know, things are compliant who are in the middle. There are next gen of developers who are retraining these uh, black box models and positioning it towards a customized uh, use case or towards a customized industry. Plus, you want explanations at different levels, right? So you want to be able to also explain uh, data sets and the features of the data sets, what do they mean? And then when you are looking at, you know, some of them are very simple models, some of them are black box models. So in case of black box models, you might want to have a surrogate model, right? Which is learning based on the explanations and creating uh, a parallel model, right? Which, which over a period of time, as it is seen the basic explanations, right? It's creating its own robust explanation model. Now, Apart from moving these projects in open source, right? So as, as a mission of trusted AI, right? As I mentioned, like we created these projects and we realized, right? These techniques being proprietary doesn't make sense. So they need to be in open source, but not only in open source, the whole IP of these projects need to be in a neutral place under a neutral governance model, right? So we move these projects to Linux Foundation AI and they are now part of the Linux Foundation AI hosted in a neutral place Hopeful that you know most of you have either used or using Qflow or you know are trying Qflow or probably have heard about Qflow, right? So it's an end-to-end -end machine learning platform, right, which goes across the whole AI lifecycle, right? So you can essentially uh, build a model using Qflow notebooks. You can then you know run distributed training on those models using different libraries like TensorFlow, PyTorch, XGBoost. We have MPI-based algorithms like Horovod, etc., inbuilt as well. Uh, you can use hyperparameter optimization engine like CATEV, which also gives you capabilities around neural architecture search. So if you need more auto AI capabilities, and then you know you can deploy your models in production, right? So uh, using uh, Qflow Survey. So end-to-end -end spectrum and tying all these things together is pipelines or machine learning pipelines, which allows you to automate this whole end-to-end -end life cycle and not only allows you to automate, but also allows you to trace the lineage, right? So I'll briefly go into them. Uh, so the two projects right, where we focused uh, from the perspective of trusted AI uh, are essentially, you know, pipelines and serving, right? And, and the reason, you know, for focusing on these projects was twofold. One, like when we talk about pipelines, what we want to do is, you know, make sure that as we are running through this AI lifecycle, there are inbuilt capabilities into these pipelines, which can then help detect uh, things like bias or, you know, if the models which are being trained, are they vulnerable to adversarial attacks, et cetera. So they can help you manage the whole life cycle and, and ensure that, you know, uh, they're able to detect if the models are being built in an ethical and trusted manner. And serving, which is care serving, right, can then, once your models are finally rolled out and deployed in production, can then help, you know, to see if your models in real world are actually adhering to these uh, trusted AI principles, and you can monitor and create metrics, right? So hence the importance of these two projects. Uh, so very quickly on pipelines, right? It's the most popular project in the pipeline, uh, Qflow umbrella, uh, targeted towards data scientists. So there is a Python DSL, so allows you to craft pipelines in a programmatic way, 
Uh, each of these steps in the pipeline is called a run, which essentially is a, a backed by a container, which essentially has the code, right, which is doing that specific part, right? And and it's very very popular in in the Qflow community, right? Because for data scientists, they can now use a Python way of running machine learning pipelines on Kubernetes, and they can also leverage underlying Kubernetes constructs like volume secrets and other things. But also, um, you know, for for operational folks, right? They can actually go. There is a very rich dashboard which shows you the streaming logs in real time, etc. And you can you know uh, look at the real uh, time logs and debug. And not only this, right? There is a strong lineage and governance, right? So you can track back, like once your models are produced on what data set it was trained on, what were the hyperparameters used, what was the version of TensorFlow. So very, very robust set of capabilities in this, right? And what we have done is, right, essentially uh, created some pipeline components, as I was mentioning, right? Pipeline uh, components are the building blocks, which essentially allows you to run. And you can change these components around uh, adversarial detection or, you know, bias detection, plug it into your own workloads, and then, you know, identify as part of that, whether your workloads are, are you know, adhering to the trusted AI principles, and then you can detect if there are bias, et cetera, being found. So with that, I will pass on to Andrew to talk a bit about Qflow pipelines and trusted AI and show you, you know, how we can leverage this in practice. So Andrew, over to you. So basically, we're going to take a look at for first uh, Kubeflow pipelines and see some of the components in action in that. So we have to set up um, a model fairness check, which works with AIF 360, and then an adversarial robustness evaluation with uh, the art tool that we have. Uh, and the first training step we're going to do is on a gender classification. So it takes images and tries to classify a gender based off of that. So the way you would run this through is click creating run and then specifying some parameters that you need for this. You might specify the attack epsilon for the fast gradient sign method uh, parameter or favorable label, which you need, AF360 needs to know what is a favorable label, uh, what they would like to see, and then an unfavorable label, what they would not like to see. And then you can also specify, specify which groups you should check the bias for. So in this case, um, we've chosen of race uh, with the label zero and the unprivileged group is race of uh, label four. So then we just can run this through. This experiment takes a while, so we won't watch it go through the whole way, but it'll just start up like this. And then some nodes will start to show up and uh, run through, but we already have a pre set up one that is executed already. So we can kind of look at what has happened. Um, so first let's look at the training step see what training logs we can get. Um, we can see all this is going on. So we can see for the failure condition uh, it is evaluated to false. So it hasn't failed yet. And then the success condition is also false. So it hasn't su succeeded yet either. And it'll continue to check that until uh, one shows up true. And in our case, it succeeded. So we've succeeded um, in training it. And then it'll store all the training parameters so that we can uh, go back into the model fairness check and the adversarial robustness evaluation and kind of take a look at what we've got there. So here we see some of the metrics and uh, there's a bunch of metrics calculated. We're just gonna look at one for time constraints. So for the disparate impact, um, the way that the disparate impact works is that it takes the probability of a favorable outcome for the unprivileged group and divides it by the probability of a favorable outcome for the privileged group. Um, so values of less than one generally indicate bias towards the uh, privileged group and uh, values close to one tend to show that there's no bias. So generally we go by the four fifths rule, which means anything less than 80% shows some sort of bias. And so we have a 77% here. Uh, which would indicate that likely there is some bias here and we would need to go and uh, mitigate it um, in some way. And then let's take a look at the robustness evaluation, see how that went. Um, so the model accuracy on uh, test data in general was 85%. And then on our adversarial samples, it comes out to only 15%. Uh, so this is not very good. It indicates that we would need to do more robust uh, training to kind of deal with adversarials. 
Um, and to go a little bit deeper into that, you can also get the average perturbation on misclassified samples. So small values show that um, your model did not perform well at all. And in fact, very little perturbation will cause a misclassification, uh, which is not good. And if this label is very high, it shows that it took a lot to uh, mess with your model and get it to mispredict. So you would prefer higher numbers. So yeah, in this case, you would find that likely um, you need to both check on the bias and to check on uh, robustness in your model training step. And so you could go and rerun this training step, perhaps with new data that you've created um, based off of the model fairness and adversarial robustness uh, data that you created in both of these steps. Um, so jumping back in. Thanks, Andrew. That was great, right? So I think in the interest of the time, we will probably, you know, speed up uh, some of the rest of the slides, right? So I think I, I gave a quick background around KF serving, right? So it's it's a solution in uh, Qflow community for production model serving, right? So it gives you a serverless machine learning inference capability built on top of Knative, right? And then, you know, there are capabilities around model explanations under which we have built uh, rest of the uh, trusted AI uh, umbrella, right? So as part of that, right? So Andrew has been working heavily in terms of integrating uh, some of these projects uh, into KF serving, including, you know, AI Explainability 360 or an AI Fairness 360. Uh, and, you know, we had the first version all done <clears throat> and delivered as part of the KF serving V0.5. So if you're interested, you can definitely try it out. A lot of times it's not possible to, to do these analysis on a single transaction, right? So you cannot just based on a single transaction say that the model is biased or not, right? Uh, so in those kind of scenarios, right, you need robust payload logging capabilities. What that means is that, you know, you're able to capture the requests which are coming to models, the responses which are going back from the models, collect, curate, and then, you know, uh, over a period of time, once you have that data, then you can run more advanced analysis with it. Hey, over the course of last 100 predictions, the model is biased, right? Or, you know, 80% of these um, um, inputs which are coming there, you know, adversarially modified and model is getting fooled, right? So to do more advanced analytics like this, you need payload logging, uh, logging which we have enabled uh, using, you know, uh, the cloud events standardized protocol, which is a standard which is being developed by the CNCF community. Okay, so, uh, Andrew, can you now talk a bit about these capabilities as part of the KF survey. Yeah, so what we've implemented in uh, KF surveying so far for the AX is uh, using a method called locally interpretable model explainability, LIME. Um, and the idea is you take an image on the left, like an MNIST uh, image, and uh, the explainer will highlight pixels that it finds are highly indicative of a certain classification. So, it, it, and you can change um, certain parameters inside of uh, Lime to get different uh, highlighted uh, pixels. Um, if you want something that is like the pixels that are most indicative of uh, a classification, then you would raise a parameter called minimum weight. Um, and then the next project, Adversarial Robustness Toolbox, uh, is using the square attack method. Um, so you take an image, uh, you add some sort of perturbation or noise, um, and you'll be given with a, another image, which is very similar to the first, but makes your model misclassify, or at least is the goal of the art tool. Um, and in most cases, that'll just be uh, small perturbations that look identical to the human eye. Um, for AIF360, the idea is to collect a bunch of payloads, as we mentioned, and then uh, through the payload logs, we can create bias metrics based off of a large uh, collection of instances and outputs. And so there's a number of specifications that you need to have here. Um, like we saw before in the KFP example, there's the favorable label, unfavorable label, privileged groups and unprivileged groups. And this just lets you know what is a favorable outcome and uh, what are the biased groups that we may need to look out for. And so the same deal with the spec here, the left is the same as you would deploy a normal predictor. And then the right is all the exp uh, extra commands and uh, information that you may need uh, in the explainer to give you something valuable. 
And so the flow of the AF360 is you send your prediction request to a model, then the model sends their logs to some sort of persistent storage. In our case, uh, when we show the demo, it'll be a message jumper. And then when the bias detection request comes through, all of the logs in the persistent storage will be sent to the AF explainer, which will then be able to calculate metrics based off of those logs. So we'll show that here. Um, so this is housed in the KF serving repo. Uh, you can just go to the samples and uh, look for it. But the basic idea is to deploy the model, uh, the bias, the predictor, and the explainer here, and the message jumper. We've already had that set up so that uh, it doesn't take a lot of time to spin them up, but because they are fairly large images, at least for some of them. Yeah, so there they are. And then the idea is to connect to it and send simulation prediction uh, requests. So I have that here. So we'll just simulate sending multiple requests just to pull some logs into the message dumpers. Uh, you can see we have about six requests and this is the response is we expect to see a few predictions and both the requests and the response will get logged. Um, and then the idea here is that we need to create a JSON from the logs. Uh, so let's just take a look at what that looks like. It's created this data.json, which is just a JSON uh, instances, which are all the logs that we've sent to it. There's quite a few because we added some information before, uh, just for added information uh, without taking up too much time. And then the outputs here are all the prediction responses uh, that we got. And so now that we have those, we can go back and we can actually query our explainer to check uh, what bias do we see. So there we go, and that's pretty quick. So now that we have that, um, let's look at the disparate impact so we can have a kind of comparison to the KFP. Um, so again, disparate impact is measuring favorable outcomes for privileged groups and unprivileged groups, the ratio. So this is much lower than the fourth fifth rule. It's actually 0.5. Um, so we would say that the model that we have deployed in KF serving is very biased. And we, what we can do since we have the payload logs for this um, is we can go back and we can see what the biased examples were. And then we can check if our model behaves differently when we change those examples to make them the privileged class. And if they do, then we can save um, new data for when we would like to retrain and keep the same examples before, but say that those examples should be marked with a favorable label rather than the unfavorable label, label that they're giving. And this will expand our data set and make it a little bit better because we know that if it is given to the privileged class, they uh, are getting acceptable results. So now we'll hop back in. Um, uh, with that, right, we are also doing a lot of great uh, work and, and advancing a lot of the principles of Trusted AI as part of the Linux Foundation AI Trusted AI Committee. Uh, we meet, you know, uh, monthly uh, where, you know, a lot of the uh, partners like, you know, the folks from the companies which are listed there or, you know, folks from Microsoft and others, right, we come together and talk uh, both about the principles, what should define the principles of Trusted AI, but also, you know, technical solutions like we discussed today, right? So if you're interested in this, definitely, you know, join this. It's, it's an exciting place where a lot of us, you know, um, people who are actually interested in advancing this field are getting together and bringing uh, technologies and tools and use cases together as part of this Linux Foundation AI Trusted AI. Here are uh, you know some of the links uh, you know, in terms of you know some of the GitHub repos or the design document right with service the KF serving payload logging. Plus you know if you do need to reach out like you know our, our Twitter or LinkedIn um, URLs are listed here. So uh, definitely you know try and reach back to us if you have any questions, comments, feedback. We would love to get your feedback and, and make sure that, you know, you're using these capabilities, advancing these capabilities, and if there are issues which you find uh, or your suggestions, uh, we would like to incorporate and advance these uh, projects together, right? So, so in the end, you know, I would like to round up by saying we definitely want to stand up for ethical AI. We are doing quite a bit of efforts, right, both as well as uh, through IBM, but also, you know, 
uh, Linux Foundation AI has been a huge partner. The Qflow community has been a huge partner. And we would like to invite all of you right into this mission in terms of bringing ethical and trusted AI to the masses and, and building you know, platforms which are essentially you know, making this core part of their DNA. Thank you. And thanks, Andrew. Yeah.